Olá, boa tarde, bem-vindos a Abrilinha ao vivo. Meu nome é Colin Flynn e hoje eu tenho o prazer de apresentar o Dr. Thomas Bach. Good afternoon and welcome to Abrilinha ao vivo, Linguists Online, which is an initiative of the Brazilian Linguistics Association. Abrilin is designed to give students and researchers free access to state-of-the-art discussions on diverse topics related to the study of human language. My name is Colin Flynn, and I'm assistant professor in Irish and applied linguistics at Dublin City University in Ireland. And it's my immense pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Thomas Bach, who will present for us a, title, a talk entitled Cognitive Neuroscience of Multilingualism and Sociolinguistics, A Tale of Two Rivers, Thomas was born in Krakow, Poland, and trained as a medical doctor at the University of Hamburg in Germany. He then went on to write a doctoral thesis on acute aphasias at the University of Freiburg. So his interest in language clearly goes back to the early stages of his career in the context of clinical care. Thomas is currently reader in human cognitive neuroscience at the University of Edinburgh. Dr. Bach has developed an international reputation through his research and copious publications in many subfields of cognitive neuroscience, in particular aphasia, dementia, and other neurodegenerative diseases, as well as embodied cognition and multilingualism. It's also notable that for eight years, Thomas was president of the research group on aphasia, dementia, and cognitive disorders of the World Federation of Neurology during which time he organized courses in cognitive neurology in Latin America, Africa, and Asia, and worked on translations and adaptations of cognitive and language assessments. Over the years, Thomas has worked in many countries. He has conducted research on a wide variety of populations, and he therefore considers himself to be a field worker and not a lab scientist. One of the most impressive aspects of Dr. Bach's academic career in this respect is that he has lectured in seven languages on every continent except Antarctica. In recent years, Thomas has become increasingly involved in research on cognitive aspects of bi and multilingualism across the lifespan. His work here is marked by an unusually high degree of interdisciplinarity, collaborating with researchers in the fields of medicine, psychology, neuroscience, education, and now socio and applied linguistics. Thomas is also very involved in public engagement and is often featured in the press, providing interviews for print media, radio, and television. In addition, Dr. Bach has been called on to share his expertise with politicians, including those in the House of Lords in Britain and the European Commission. With that introduction made, it's simply left for me to thank Thomas for this collaboration. I'm sure today's talk will prove to be extremely interesting and stimulating. I'd also like to remind the audience that questions can be asked via the chat function. We presume that most questions will be in English. However, we will welcome questions in Portuguese as well, since myself and Thomas are relatively proficient speakers of the language. Perguntas em português também são bem-vindas. With that, I will turn the microphone over to my friend and colleague, Dr. Thomas Bach. Eh, quero começar eh, agradecendo o convite. Eu, eh, eu acho que a Bralinha é uma, é uma ideia fantástica, e não só é uma criação de um tesouro de conhecimento, mas também é de, uma, de uma comunidade internacional global, de toda a gente interessada em linguística. E por isso, para mim é um honor, um prazer, é, falar de uma palestra na série de, de Abralim. E a verdade é que tenho muito, muito é, saudades, muita saudade do Brasil e espero que um dia possa viajar de novo. Okay, thank you very much. So I hope that it works now. So I am now showing the first slide. So I know that linguists, uh, particularly in Australia, but I think probably in many other places as well, like to start their talk by paying homage to the original languages and the original ethnic groups in the place from which they are speaking. And what I usually like doing is to pay homage to the special people connected with the day. 
And I'm very fortunate because today I can combine both. Today we have, of course, St. Patrick's Day and a very multilingual saint. In fact, there has been, as you can see, some uh, serious scholarly debate on the question what language uh, St. Patrick was swearing in. However, what we can definitely say is that he probably spoke some form of Brythonic of what could be considered Old Welsh. And in fact, that would be more or less the same language that was spoken here in Edinburgh, where I'm at the moment. So, as I've been told, the oldest poem in Welsh language by Aneirin Igododin from around 600, so not that far away from the lifetime of St. Patrick, was composed here around Edinburgh. So if he came here, he probably would be able to understand people in their language and, and be understood. However, we have also two anniversaries connected to Scotland. Uh, one is 1328, Treaty of Edinburgh, also on 17th of March, when Kingdom of England recognized independence of the Kingdom of Scotland. And 1473, the birth of James IV, one of the greatest Scottish kings, and incidentally, the last one who is reputed to be able to speak Gaelic. So, in fact, it is said that at his coronation, the Shonichi, the narrator, storyteller, was telling the whole story of the family going back to the remote ancestors. And indeed, narration will be one of the big topics of my talk today. So, to start with, I feel a little bit guilty, so to say, speaking here, because, in fact, as uh, Colin said, I am not a linguist by training. Uh, so let me just in this and next slide explain a little bit how I came into my interest of language. I was born in Krakow, Poland, so on, you can see on the left side, as son of a Polish-speaking father and German-speaking mother. So I could have easily, since my father was a fluent German speaker as well, have grown up bilingually, but at that time there were a lot of prejudices against bilingualism, with the idea that it's very dangerous, children will get confused, may become schizophrenic, so definitely not. And then I still had to learn German because I moved to Germany with 17. I studied medicine there and I wanted to combine my interest with languages and, uh, and with, uh, I mean, languages and medicine, doing a doctorate on aphasia, on language disorders caused by brain diseases. And then I was working in psychiatry and neurology in Bern, in Switzerland, in Berlin, Cambridge, and since 2006, Edinburgh. Now, I would say probably the most cherished compliment I ever got is from Martin Haspelmatt, my friend whom you can see here, who described me as a linguist of the Zweiten Bildungsweg. Now, for those of you not familiar with the German education system, Zweite Bildungsweg, or secondary path of education, is for people who kind of, for whatever reason, didn't uh, want or didn't manage to do their A-levels. They are already working and they kind of catch up with their A-levels in uh, evening school so that they could go to the university. So that's a little bit the history of my relationship to linguistics. So I did doctorate in Freiburg and Kreisgau, and I have to say one of the impressive things was that the uh, it was an incredibly interdisciplinary atmosphere there. So here's a picture of my um, doctor father, as you say in German, my supervisor Klaus Wallisch, and the beautiful city of uh, Freiburg in the Black Forest. And he was a neurologist, but we were working very closely together with psychologists and with linguists. So that was the atmosphere that I would say I kind of grew up with academically. And throughout my career, I was searching for encounters with linguists and linguistics by reading books, uh, listening to lectures or going to lectures, uh, attending summer schools at Cornell and Cagliari uh, in typology. But also in my own work, I came again and again uh, across linguistic questions. So, for instance, in my first position psychiatry in Bern in Switzerland, with the question of schizophagia, language disorders in schizophrenia, are they language or thought disorders? Later in my Cambridge time in embodied cognition, when I was working on noun and verb dissociations, and then as president of World Federation of Neurology Research Group on aphasia, dementia, and cognitive disorders, when I was organizing cognitive clinics worldwide, and was confronted, of course, very often with the question of adaptation and translation of tests into different languages. Now, 
uh, over the last years, it's mainly about multilingualism in cognitive aging, stroke and dementia. And by the way, I have a lot of, as you will see, I have a lot of cross-referencing to different Abralin talks. So here's the first one to Martin Haspelmatz. So if you see it, it means that you have a, a chance to see those talks on Abralin website. Now, I have to say I am a big fan of interdisciplinarity and for me it has at least two big pleasures which are in a way complementary. One is, and I would say particularly so in our time of lockdown, that it offer us, offers us an exciting opportunity of exciting mental travel a tour of new places. So for instance, now reading about sociolinguistics, I'm not exaggerating, it's not just a metaphor of new places, because where else would I have heard about Martha's Vineyard? And if I ever go now in a department store in Lower East Side in, uh, in Manhattan asking for fourth floor, it will be a different place again. And uh, of course, Belfast of Milleries and so on. So we need new, we meet, so to say, we learn new places, we meet new people. And through Abralini, I met now Sally Tariamonte, with whom we are now corresponding. And it's also a little bit learning new language. So it was fascinating for me to see how many things are in fact very similar between neuroscience and and uh, sociolinguistic, but we simply refer with different words to it. And indeed, even here on the slide, uh, the uh, I would say the advice that Sally Tariamonte is giving to her interviewers and students is very, very similar to what I tell my students before they go to see patients. However, there is a second, I would say, equally fascinating aspect, and that is that working in disciplinary makes us reflect on our own approach. So, thinking about neurology, I came more and more to the conviction that much of it is basically the art of the narrative. Let me explain, because narrative sounds maybe as something, you know, imprecise and, you know, fiction and so on, so on. No, no it has to be as accurate as possible. There are at least four narratives that we have basically in every case that we want to approach. The first is the narrative of the patient, the history taking, finding out how the symptoms developed and so on. And it's a whole art to get this information. Then at least in dementia, I would say it's equally relevant to get the information from relatives, uh, proxy information from someone else. And sometimes I would say in cases of frontotemporal dementia, sometimes the discrepancy between the history from the patient and the family might already be the main hint at the diagnosis. Then there is a third stage which doesn't have to be done, but I like to do it, and that is to offer the story back to the patient, to say what I have learned, to find out whether they can identify with the story, whether they think I got it right, or whether they want to uh, more or less you know, revise something. And then the last bit is, I would say in some way the most complex, is to have a kind of story which then take all this together into my own narrative, and that is something I might need to tell my colleague, where, for instance, he or she will be taking over the patient. So from this point of view, narratives are crucial, and getting narrative wrong can endanger the patient. So it's not just about telling something, it's about trying to tell the right thing. And, by the way, I was very pleased, as I learned from uh, Nick Evans, about this very recent uh, issue in studies in history and philosophy of science, which basically focuses on the question of narrative in science, both in history and philosophy, but also in medicine. So what I want to offer you today is not one narrative of multilingualism, but four of them. Let me start with the first. So the first story or narrative is multilingualism as division and confusion. Now, we all know, of course, the story of the Tower of Babel and the idea that in the beginning everybody was speaking the same language and in fact multilingualism in this model could be seen as a punishment for our sins. And indeed, throughout history, there have been many narratives where multilingualism was perceived as a danger to the state, one country, one language. Now, I think on St. Patrick's Day, I don't 
need to remind Irish audience of Edward III and the status of Kilkenny and the Scottish audience of James VI and the status of Iona in uh, first case against the Irish and second against the Gallic language and much of it can be found in current political narratives. I don't think I have to go into detail. But the reason why I have here also an Inca emperor is to show this is not just a kind of Anglo-Saxon or even Western attitude across history we had two very very different approaches to uh, to um, uh, bilingualism and multilingualism and the reason i think it's important is because they influence also how science started to be conducted about uh, about multilingualism so this is one of the kind of first studies which tried systematically to look whether there were differences in intelligence between in this case english monolingual children and english welsh bilingual children and they also found that basically the welsh speaking children are much worse in everything confused the main term is here confused as he says which a confusion is carried over from the brain area connected with language to those connected with other functions. Now, there is not really much about brain in this paper. I mean, the, the author was not particularly, I think, uh, into research on the brain. It was perceived by him as self-evident that there must be some brain area for language, and then if you try to squeeze a second language, then it must have bad uh, consequences. However, it becomes much clearer if we read what the language ideology was. So that's one of the first paragraphs of the paper. Under British rule, there are many people who speak other tongues and consciously or unconsciously, the English language is coming gradually to prevail in the subject states of Britain. The natives during this process passing through various stages of bilingualism. So here we have it. There was the assumption that basically there are three stages of human development, the lowest where people speak something different from English, the kind of intermediate where they already speak English but still have their other language, that's a transitional stage, and then the highest where they become English monolinguals. So I would say for me there's a very clear connection here between the language ideology and the statements made about the brain. Now you think this is old, this is almost 100 years old, and you know nowadays it's completely different. Unfortunately, at least in the UK, it's not. Here on the left you can see the national census, and it couldn't be more up to date because the census date is in fact next weekend. And despite me and many colleagues trying to convince the Office for National Statistics to allow people to name more than one language, you are only allowed to speak one. So basically there's main language and the Office of National Statistics was absolutely adamant that they will not change it into the plural of languages. Because once you speak English, everything else is completely superfluous. So I would say this idea basically of the highest level of human existence being a monolingual English speaker is at least very popular and I would say institutionalized in England. Now, here you can see other examples of that. Uh, doctors give pupils sick notes to duck French and German lessons among fears. The stress of learning a second language is harming their mental health. And other children find foreign languages so stressful they are being signed off by a GP. And just to kind of put this in the model, Here's a nice citation. The human brain, so again, we have a brain as the argument, can only contain a finite amount of information. And as English speakers, we are fortunate not to need a secondary language. That space is much better utilized for science, history, and our rich culture. That was, by the way, a comment by a reader from Daily Mail who very much disliked one of the papers of mine, which I will be presenting a bit later. So this is, I would say, still probably the predominant view of multilingualism in England, at least. So to summarize the story one, the idea is that monolingualism is the natural state of human brain and mind. 
And since the brain mind, and in a way also a society or a state, has a limited storage capacity, additional languages take away something. They cause confusion at the level of individuals, and they cause division, strife, and conflict at the level of societies. Now, one of the problems here is that I think this model, I mean, firstly, apart from the fact that clearly we see brain in a very different way, as I will be showing at the kind of towards the end of this talk, uh, that it confuses effort and burden. Yes, it might be an effort to learn a language, or in fact, it might be an effort to use different languages, but this is a positive effort, which is basically an exercise which brings a positive effects for our mental capacities. And that is something, by the way, which again, a cross-reference to another Abralin talk by Judy Kroll, who was speaking about desirable difficulties, I think, a bit earlier this month. So that's story number one. The story number two, as you can imagine, will be not only different, will be exactly opposite. So in some way, here bilingualism becomes, or multilingualism, a paradise lost and a fountain of youth. Now, to start with, against our Bible story, there are also other creation myths. And here I have to acknowledge, I mean, I'm very indebted to, you know, fantastic conversations I always have with Nick Evans, and the story of Warra Murungunji, the ancestral goddess of northern Australian tribes, who, according to the myth, traveled from uh, Indonesia under the sea and came in on land was uh, coming on land was giving people their own land food and language so in a way from the beginning the world was created as a multilingual one and uh, as you can see uh, partly in his abralin but also in ilara talk i mean i don't know if you know ilara institut uh, de langar a great great uh, institution also with um, very, very good online uh, resources and lectures. There is a, a multilingual song cycle, a kind of celebration where the different linguistic groups come together. And it can only happen because different groups bring their complementarily distributed knowledge of languages. So in a way, this ceremony requires Multilingualism. It cannot be done monolingually. By the way, I mean, just to show that this is not just some strange thing about Australia, there are also uh, other Abralin talks by Friederike Lübke about uh, West Africa and by Alexandra Eichenwald uh, about Amazon. Now, also in terms of states, some states were in fact very tolerant of multilingualism. I give you as an example here are the ruins of Persepolis. The Persian Empire was extremely multilingual. Here we have Mithridates, king of, um, king of Pontus, who was supposed or reported by Pliny the Older to speak all 26 languages of his subjects, and Alfonso de Sabio from Castile, who would be writing his uh, legal, political epic tests in Spanish, but poetry in Galaico portuguese So, in this positive narrative came the science, I mean, science came relatively late in the 60s. So I would say until 60s, the idea was really that bilingualism was very dangerous and kind of destroys intelligence. And here we have a crucial study to which I will come a little bit later again, by Peel and Lambert, 1962, which found that in fact, if we match children for the socioeconomic status, for the, for the parents' education, and so on, that in fact, if anything, bilingual children outperform the monolingual ones. And over 80s and 90s, there has been a lot of research showing, for the first time in, first in children, that they outperform the bilingual, the monolingual in many uh, tasks, particularly in metalinguistic skills in social cognition and in executive functions. By early 21st century, it became clear that this is not just a childhood effect. It has been also observed 2004 in older participants and 2007 in dementia patients. Now, uh, if you want to hear more about details of this, so as I say, I cannot go again in detail about, uh, there is great talk by Ellen Białystok, one of the authors of this 
2004-2007 paper. So this is uh, Maurice Friedman, Fergus Craig, and Ellen B. Wistock. And if you are interested in executive functions, there is also freely available a lecture of mine on executive brain. I think it could be very interesting for linguists because it's a kind of double borrowing. The term executive, originally coming from legal and political thought, came into neuroscience in two ways, one's via computer science and one's via business, with almost opposite meanings. So, looking at this and being interested in dementia, uh, and at that time I think already uh, also working for a uh, World Federation of Neurology in this field, I thought that would be something that really should be done in India, being an incredibly multilingual country, and I was lucky to be still in touch with my Cambridge colleague Suvarna Alladi in Hyderabad. Hyderabad has been multilingual for centuries, probably five centuries, if not a millennium. So one of the confounds in many bilingual studies in that bilinguals are or have immigrant background is not really relevant in Hyderabad. So it's not associated with immigration. And uh, Hyderabad, the Nizam's institute where this research has been conducted, has excellent clinical services with a Cambridge-style cognitive clinic and multilingual tests and importantly multilingual stuff. So people can not only be tested in their language, but also by someone who knows, so to say, the language that they prefer. And the results in 648 patients, again about 60% bilingual, which would be roughly the same as in the general population, four years delay, very, very similar to the Toronto study, but even more so six years in illiterate. So again, it's not a question of uh, education. You have people who never went to school, but who speak two or three languages, and in fact, they are much more ahead, so to say, or in this case, much more behind in the terms of the first presentation of dementia. There were also differences between different types of dementia, uh, and I would be happy to go into details uh, about that in questions, but as I say, not every dementia is the same, and that has been very often misinterpreted in uh, some of the studies. The second most important cognitive disorder, uh, I mean, apart from dementia, is stroke. So we did another study with 608 stroke patients, again, roughly 60% bilingual. And, well, firstly, there was no difference in the age of stroke. So that means there is no kind of general protection. It's not that the bilinguals were healthier. They had stroke at about the same age, but the outcome was much better. Normal cognition was reaching more than 40% of the bilingual, but less than 20% monolingual patients. Interestingly, there was roughly the same percentage of aphasia, so of language disorders, around 10%. But if we look at the uh, how pronounced the aphasia is, we will find that global aphasia was present in uh, practically almost 60% of monolinguals and less than 20 bilinguals. So again, there is a difference in severity. Now, this of course asks for further studies looking in aging and particularly at the very difficult topic of reverse causality. So the people I was now presenting were not people who necessarily grew up in bilingual families. They picked up the languages often in later childhood or adolescence and so on on the street while working. And you could easily argue, so maybe it's not about lang learning languages, which brings, so to say, makes the uh, them uh, better in cognitive tasks, but maybe people who are brighter are more likely to learn languages. So chicken and egg question, or as we call it in science, reverse causality. Not very easy to address. However, in Scotland we have a unique opportunity to do it through the so-called uh, Lawsian birth cohort. So all people born in 1936 who were 11 in 1947 at school were tested for their intelligence. And now, they are now, well, 70, that would be in the 80s, we can retest them looking how it changed in comparison to the previous stage. So I think in sociolinguistic, it would be called probably a real-time panel study. And uh, we know, of course, that if you are bright as a child, then you are likely to also be, so to say, on the higher uh, end of the scale when you are older. So we could look whether people who learned a second language after age 11 performed better 
then could be predicted from their childhood intelligence, and that was indeed the case. So from this point of view, we could say that it's not just about reverse causality, there is definitely also a positive effect of uh, from childhood, so to say, to old age. And then some other studies where we are looking at, uh, at these things. I mean, one of the tests I very much like using in my research is a test of everyday attention because it's a clinically developed, clinically valid test. So I know it has what we call ecological validity. So it predicts, for instance, how quickly patients with head injuries can rehabilitate and go back to university or to uh, their jobs and so on. It's auditory. Uh, most of the other tests are uh, visual, non-verbal, and has not what we call ceiling and practice effect. So you can repeat it without people getting better, which means it's very good for longitudinal studies. And we did a study of attention switching in Edinburgh students. So that was here a study which in a way was, I think, in uh, sociolinguistic would call probably apparent time. So we had first and fourth year students. So they were uh, they were different students. But what we found that first year students there was no difference between languages and humanities. But in year four the language students outperformed the humanities students significantly. And that was the study by Vega Mendoza, uh, Mariana Vega Mendoza here on the left, my PhD student, and complemented a few years later by a study by Madi Long on the right here, intensive Gallic course uh, in Salmor Ostak on the Isle of Skye, where we found improvement in attention switching already after one week intensive course. And this in group from 18 to 85. And it was persisting in those who practice more than five hours a week. Now, it already sounds a little bit too good, doesn't it? And I think the problem is that, of course, these findings can very easily be kind of taken one step further. And then, you know, multilingualism will mean people love each other and are tolerant. And it's like the fountain of youth. You are younger, never get dementia. And indeed, it makes you even a better lover. Now, I'm not saying it's not the case, but there is certainly not a double blind controlled study that would show that bilinguals are better lovers. So there has been quite a lot of hype around it. And I would say for a scientist it's very difficult to really counteract it. Why? Let me give a very nice example of four papers, two of which have a more simple and two of which have a more complex message. So the paper which I already mentioned, Aladi et al. 2013, bilingualism delays the age of onset of dementia independent of education and immigration status. Got 428 citations, which I would say is not bad. So certainly people really didn't know it. Now, a few years later, we wrote another paper, still a big study, 200 patients with frontotemporal dementia, certainly the biggest FTD study, I think, in this uh, context, but with a slightly more complex message. Bilingualism delays the onset of behavior, but not a phasic form of FTD. FTD is frontotemporal dementia. 28 citations only. And something similar when we compare two studies, both resulting from Lowe's and Burr's cohort. 2014, does bilingualism influence cognitive aging? Independent of childhood IQ, 296 citations. Then, just two years later, Bilingualism, social cognition, and executive functions, a tale of chickens and eggs. So here we'll show that there was basically a kind of relationship in both directions, 48 citations. So there is a general, let's say, incentive to produce simple messages, which sometimes are not necessarily ro completely wrong, but are telling only half of the story. And I think that led to a uh, so to say, third narrative, uh, which here I call the baby and the bathwater, because there was a movement which said, well, maybe all these bilingual advantages are complete, uh, complete fake, complete story. So in 2013, Ken Papp in California and his colleagues did not replicate the results of other groups. And since then, there has been an increasing amount of conflicting evidence. So every year, the a lot of studies which show positive effects of bilingualism and equally a lot of studies which show a negative one. And I would say by 2016-17 there was almost a fashion uh, 
for bilingual advantage debates. So uh, Ellen Biawistok, whom you learned from, from previous slides, had one with Manolo Carreras, then I had one with Pap, then I had one with Carreras, and so on. Very entertaining, so it brought me into beautiful places like Hent here in the upper picture and Akaslompolo in Finland, in uh, the lower, in North Finland, the lower picture. But uh, I would say, I ask myself more and more how much these are really productive intellectual debates and how much they become more a kind of trench warfare. Now, the kind of bilingual advantage criticism is very often framed in the terminology of the so-called replication crisis. So using terms like failure to replicate, low reproducibility, confirmation bias, and so on. However, the underlying assumption is that there is an either or dichotomy. So basically, there is either bilingual advantage and then it has to be everywhere, or there is none and then nothing is allowed. So an extreme point of view in which so to say one side must be completely right, the other completely wrong. And it is based very much on the assumption that studies should replicate independently of time, place and method. Now, in several papers, I was kind of discussing why I don't think this is very realistic. So firstly, of course, we have different populations from genetics to environment. We have different interacting variables. Immigration, well, you can probably control this relatively well if you don't do all your studies in the US, but go to countries like, for instance, India, where you have in situ multilingualism and you, you know, well, it was there for thousands of years. Education, Again, it's kind of complex, but it can be done. I mean, very often you have what I call the kind of sandwich model of society with bilinguals coming at the top and the bottom and the uh, monolinguals coming in the middle. Socioeconomic status, again, it depends on countries. In some, you can control it better than others. There are different measures, tasks, clinical measures. So for instance, it makes a difference whether you look at uh, patients which only enter a study with 65 because FTD, frontal temporal dementia, by then might have already converted to dementia. Reverse causality, I was mentioning to you. And then interpretation of the data, selection, focus, understanding. So there are a lot of reasons why we could have two studies which show different results, but it doesn't mean that one is completely wrong and one is completely uh, right. Now, let me give you a metaphor to kind of make it clearer. Imagine that my task is now to find out at what temperature the water boils. So I do my study in Edinburgh and I find 100 degrees Celsius. I email my friends in Amsterdam, New York, they find the same and the same in San Francisco and even in Shanghai it's the same. So I could be very tempted to believe that this must be definitely correct. But then the message comes from La Paz in Bolivia that they found it's close to 90, maybe 93 or so. And similar things come from Addis Abeba or Lhasa. Now, does it mean because there are fewer places that this is wrong? Well, no, of course we know now, because there is another variable that we might not have thought about before, and that is altitude. Now, of course, once you know this variable, you can put in your models. But unless you do empirical studies, you will probably not realize that. So, the kind of the main message from this cooking pasta in La Paz paper. So unfortunately, I have two papers in the same journal, Linguistic Approaches to Bilingualism, the same year. But that was that a large N doesn't mean that something is universal truth, and an exception doesn't mean that it's an error. There is an incredible fashion now for systematic division meta-analysis, but the problem is what counts is not only the number of studies and participants, but the diversity. So if you have 10 studies from exactly same circumstances, they will not invalidate others. So let's say, you know, 100 studies made at the sea level will not invalidate one single study made at the level of 4,000 meters. So one can start asking why is in this kind of whole debate so much hostility, particularly towards bilingualism. If you compare it with education, that's quite interesting. There is a lot of conflicting evidence for education, whether it delays the onset of dementia and so on. There are some studies showing yes, some not, some only in special gender or special groups and so on. And yet, I don't think I have ever seen a paper which would doubt that education has a positive effect. So generally, if a study doesn't show an effect of education, the problem is assumed to be with the study. 
if a study doesn't show an effect of bilingualism, the study is assumed to have uh, done correctly, and the problem is with bilingualism. So one of the reasons could be that maybe, although the third narrative, the kind of replication narrative, was never consciously bringing the old ideas and prejudices against bilingualism, I would say it fits very nicely for some people coming from, let's say, normative monoglot ideology, or what I would call egocentric universalism. I live in a monolingual society and therefore human societies are monolingual they will find these messages very welcoming. But I think there's something more, and I wonder whether this could be a little bit of nostalgia for old modular models of language. And that brings me to my last and fourth narrative, where I try to integrate the cognitive neuroscience and sociolinguistics uh, in a story of two encounters, one lost chance and an opportunity for future. So the metaphor of the two rivers uh, comes, in fact, from my travels. Uh, you, can, you can tell I miss my traveling. Uh, from my travels often to India or China, going via Dubai. So you travel through East Asia and you travel over Tigris and Euphrates. So the Fertile Crescent, where the agriculture started and so on. But fascinatingly, Tigris and Euphrates are very, very close. Then they flow quite apart and they are close again. Then they go apart and they are coming together. And that's a little bit how I think sociolinguistics and, and cognitive neuroscience of multilingualism worked. So here I have to uh, you know, acknowledge particularly Collins. I'm really, really glad that he is happy to discuss him today because, of course, I know knew Wallace Lambert from the paper that I already presented to you in 1962. So for me, he was someone from cognitive psychology. But then Colin made it clear to me that he's also someone with very clear and strong track record was in sociolinguistic and indeed in second language acquisition, SLA. So I think one of the reasons why the studies in the 60s finally started to find, so to say, effects of bilingualism was because people were conscious of sociolinguistic variables and therefore were much more careful matching the groups then were previous studies, for instance, the one in Wales, where basically rural kids were compared with you know, kids from a much more well-to-do uh, urban household, and so on and so on. So I would say around 60, 1960, there would have been probably quite a lot of dialogue. And in fact, the same person having PhD students working more in cognitive or more in sociolinguistic direction. But now a lot of things happened in the 60s. A lot of things happen in neurology, so for me it's fascinating time to you know, read about because a lot of diseases I was working about, like PSP, MSA, CBD, were first described in the 60s. New drugs were developed, like anti-Parkinsonian drugs, neuroleptics and antidepressants. By the way, the new drugs led also to discovery of this new uh, disease and so on and so on. It was a very interesting time in psychology as well with the idea of cognition as computation, basically the birth of kind of modern style cognitive psychology, but also, of course, a fundamentally important time in linguistics. And here again, the Abralini fans have the unique opportunity to listen to both the kind of the founding father of generativism and of sociolinguistics, so Chomsky and Labov. And if you want a little bit more of a kind of contextual knowledge, uh, I recommend very much Dirk Herard's. Uh, so there is an Abralin talk by him, but also other papers in which he kind of tells the story how, and that's where you have the slide here, how linguistics or the kind of grammar became completely de contextualized in the 60s and 70s, and then in 80s and 90s in cognitive linguistics, it got recontextualized. And then a very, very nice talk by uh, Sally Tagliamonte about variationist approach. So I was very fascinated, I have to admit, by variationist approach. So I started thinking, so how can I, as a simple medic, kind of imagine how it works? Well, this is my metaphor. So imagine that generativists and sociolinguists are now given the task to study alcohol. Sociolinguists will probably started looking, oh, where do all these things come from? And I hope my Brazilian audience will recognize the bottles of cachaça, ipioca, mansasogra, and so on. Now, which are 
posh drinks, which are simple drinks? Are there any drinks that would be considered ladies' drinks or men's drinks or maybe something you have in the morning, in the evening? You can imagine enormous number of questions like this. Now, I would say generativists would probably sniff a little bit at the bottle and say, I solve the problem, it's all C2H5OH. Now, it's not that one of these approaches is right and the other is wrong. They are, they find very different things interesting, worth researching and worth looking for uh, in more details. Now, as it happened in aphasiology, in the time where I started working in this field, in the 80s, it was all very, very modular. So the kind of the Bible of the time was Fodor's modularity of mind. The models were this kind of neat uh, boxes models with arrows in between. Language was considered autonomous. And it meant that much of aphasia research was looking for this elusive, selective and stable impairment of the grammar module. So the idea was there must be this grammar module and then some patients will have this, so to say, knocked out. A lot of assessment and indeed treatment focus on building of passive constructions. So I remember when I first went in late 90s to a conference in Philadelphia of Academy of Aphasia, I was stunned during the poster session that almost all therapy posters were about how to teach patients how to produce passive sentences. And there was only one how to produce questions and none how to negate a sentence. Now, I would say, for instance, if I had really great problems and struggling with language, then maybe asking a question and being able to say yes or no, which, as you will know as linguist, is not banal in many languages, might be more relevant than uh, transferring uh, passive into active and active into passive sentences. So, maybe in that time, we should have been hanging out more with sociolinguists because what we would have learned from them was the variationist approach. And in fact, a little bit later, it came into aphasiology as well, late 80s, 90s. It was discovered that in fact, what we could have seen from the beginning, there is quite a lot of variation, not only between, but also within patients. And this variation is not just some random noise, but a worthwhile and important object of study. It can be studied and it should be studied. So, for instance, the degree of agrammatism depends on the context and, for instance, on time constraints put on patient. So that led over the 80s and 90s to the development of the concept of aphasia syndromes being products of compensation rather than this neat healthy brain minus the lesion. So it's not healthy brain minus the lesion, it's whatever is left in the brain trying to cope with the damage. Now, importantly, I would say this has also for me the effect that it makes patient an agent. So the patient is not just a passive sufferer from the damage, but is trying to overcome it with compensation strategies. And here just one example because I was so moved when I heard it, I will never forget it. A patient with semantic dementia is incredibly, I mean, very, very limited verbal, uh, so to say, I mean, fluent, but very, very small vocabulary. Words like lonely, alone, home, house were gone. She was feeling very lonely after her husband died. And when I asked her how she felt, she told me, when I am at my place, it's only me and the place. Now, you can see that this is written by someone who has only very high frequency words. And yet, for me, this is one of the most moving descriptions of loneliness I ever heard. I would say, for me, it's a poetic quality. It reminds me a little bit of, you know, uh, Carlos Drummond de Andrade, uh, O Mundo é Grande, Cabe nesta janela sobre o mar. Simple words, but incredibly powerful. So, I would say that this change also led to us recognizing, as I say, patient as agent, and of course it led also to an increased interest in differences between languages, because in this previous thing, any difference between languages was just a nuisance, another white noise that needs to be minimized. In a variationist approach, we can learn from differences between languages. And that, so that was the lost chance that I uh, 
wanted to say. Now, fortunately, the multilinguism research nowadays is much closer again to sociolinguistics. So we moved from modules to networks. Uh, it has many reasons. Some of them is, in fact, much more sophisticated technology, whether uh, machine learning in computer science or pathology and neuroimaging, an increased appreciation of the importance of social cognition, what uh, Dirk Herrards would call recontextualizing linguistics. And in these models, linguistic environment becomes more and more important and sociolinguistic variables become relevant for cognition. Not only proficiency and age of acquisition, which were recognized already earlier, but the changing patterns of use, code switching. So what matters is not just the abstract competence that you have acquired in the first couple of years and then simply keep for the rest of your life. It is an ever-changing pattern of use which matters. And that is, I think, nicely illustrated with two models coming from the same great thinker in this field, David Green. Uh, Green, 98, still very much in the kind of spirit, I would say, of the more kind of uh, Box and Arrows models, and then a much newer uh, Abu Talebi and, and Green Abu Talebi model, 2013, where you see a lot of interaction between basically the language use. So that's how changing patterns of use and code switching became relevant. Now I am moving to my penultimate slide. So we had now this kind of two encounters. We had one lost chance. And now I want to finish kind of positively, which I think is a great opportunity for future. Now, some of you might recognize this slide here in the middle. This is from the talk by Judy Crow, which I mentioned already before, given and uh, early, uh, uh, I think early March, just two weeks ago or so. And she was kindly citing a, a article in conversation that I wrote uh, in context of a play. So it's a work of art, a play based on autobiographical material about a Gallic English speaking bilingual who, as she becomes demented, is losing her uh, English and practically returns to speaking only Gallic, even with her husband who doesn't speak a word of Gallic. Now, so I'm a kind of scientific advisor on this, and I found, I mean, the whole story incredibly convincing, which is in a way not surprising because they say it's based on autobiographical material, so, so it's really a very, very good observation. Now, this brings the question, what happens when we start losing languages if we are multilingual? Now, this question has already been addressed quite a lot in aphasia. So, in aphasia already in late 19th century, there were kind of two, let's say, competing theories, which at the end were both recognized to, you know, be valid in some cases. The first was Ribot's law, so the idea that the first language always has an advantage. So, basically, you always return to your first language. If you lose something, you lose the language land thereafter. But then there was the opposite, Petra's law, in which it was the opposite. So LN, I mean the last language, so the language that the patient spoke most before becoming aphasic, before their stroke or injury and so on, were the languages that they spoke, uh, that they spoke best. Now, how is it in healthy aging and dementia? There is a lot of anecdotal evidence suggesting reversion to L1. And in fact, I have to say that there are so many talks, or at least they used to be in the time where we didn't have everything just via Zoom, where after the talk someone would come up to me and say, oh, it's interesting what you say because my grandmother and so on and so on. So there are many stories like this. And indeed, you can see here logo of Guardian Carers. That's a professional carer company in UK, which is taking language very seriously, unlike the Office for National Statistics, and indeed observed that many clients come with very clear wishes. It's very important for them to have a carer who can speak the language of the patient. So, so together with my uh, PhD student, uh, Brittany Blankenship, whom you can see above the Guardian Carers logo in Stockholm, we started doing a questionnaire looking, and by the way, you can 
help us with research. So here is the link or in fact the QR code. So the questionnaire is still open and it's for anybody who is multilingual, either multilingual over 50 or knows anybody who is multilingual over 50 because we have one version which is the a self-report and one version proxy where you can report about your family members, friends, and so on and so on. So the first thing, if you look at the table on the left, is in a lot of cases there is no change, which I find quite reassuring because otherwise we would probably believe it's very, very biased. Only people who observe some changes are getting back to us. But then we have something very interesting. So reversion is indeed observed, but it seems to be more observed by proxies then by patients. Remember, they are about two and a half more self-reports than we have proxies and about the same number of reversions. In attrition, so losing the first language is exactly the opposite. All 19 are in self-report, not a single one proxy. Now, how can we explain it? I have to say when I had a look at this data, I thought, oh no, why haven't I thought about it before? Now, in a way, it's very logical. In many of those cases, there are many families of migrants, they move to a new country, their children do not speak their first language. So how can they know that the first language is going? So let's say, in this, going back to the case of this Gallic uh, English woman, if she would have been losing Gallic, the husband wouldn't have noticed that. Maybe the only person noticing would have been the priest if she was going still to the Gallic church, uh, but our Gallic speaking church. So from this point of view, I mean, I have to say in the case of my daughter, I mean, she would probably not notice if my Polish is gone. She would notice when my Spanish, which I speak with her, or English would be gone. So what we could have here is that there are so many reports, proxy reports of these changes, because basically people don't notice with the, if the first language is affected. And another thing which we find is a language mixing. Now, I know that, let's say, I mean, I was telling about code switching and for a long time it was completely, I would say, taboo. So the idea was you always have to keep your languages apart, uh, which is, of course, not realistic. Code switching has been a feature of, you know, human language for millennia, but we went maybe into the other extreme. So code switching is perceived absolutely normal. A lot of people really don't want to mix languages. They want to keep them apart. And you can see from this table that you find in self-report, a lot of people say that they, they mix languages more than before, 54. That's practically more than a third, that's almost a half. And in fact, 46 of them say non-intentional. So I don't want to mix them, but I cannot take them apart. So from this point of view, I think they are very, very interesting things to find. And please, please help us. Everybody of you can help. I'm pretty sure that, you know, if you are under 50, you will know someone above 50 whom you can report about. And that brings me to my last slide, because I think that this field of multilingualism across lifespan, particularly looking at aging, but also dementia, is a perfect field for a interdisciplinary work. It has clear biological elements. So, of course, we have hippocampus, the connections to media temporal lobes, posterior cingulate, all the kind of, uh, all the important brain structures, temporal gradient, biology is important. Cognitive, I mean, ideas that, you know, Judy Kroll said about L1 inhibition, cognitive control, and so on have to be taken into account. I mean, what happens when people, when people's cognitive control is getting weaker, so to say, with aging or dementia. Emotional factors have been discussed. So for instance, in study of Dutch immigrants in Australia, it was said maybe much of this is not that they cannot really speak English, but they feel more nostalgic. They withdraw from active life and they become more and more voluntarily, so to say, going back to their, the world of their childhood. From social point of view, we have to remember that chronological, biological, and social age might be very different. So people might be, for instance, retiring some very early, some very late, that could have very strong effects on cognition. And then sociolinguists have been studying this phenomena for ages. 
there is there are studies about age gradient about the middle age bias which basically childhood and old age almost seem like you know measured on this and of course the kind of ideas like linguistic marketplace coming you know influenced by Bourdieu and so on so I think a lot of very very interlinked aspects and then the last point not to forget I find it fascinating linguistic anthropology I was speaking with uh, one of the uh, PhD students of, of uh, Nick about Nick Evans about the situation for older people in different country uh, I mean uh, communities particularly in Papua New Guinea in this case and would say well with time people are speaking whatever they want because they have increased status so they can decide which language they speak they have more autonomy and in fact the idea and that is something which Nick said as well is that basically over your lifetime you uh, collect languages you become more monoly, uh, multilingual and here going back because you probably have not seen it and I would not have seen it in the table you see also positive changes. So we had at least 12 people, three in proxy and nine in self-report, who reported that in fact, they became better and more monolingual, uh, multilingual. So from this point of view, I think we can learn really, really something from looking at those societies. So my idea is coming back, you might recognize the map, that's a memory test for you on the last slide. Uh, this is the map of uh, Warramurungundri's travel. And you might remember that this ceremony, the sing song cycle, requires people coming speaking different languages. I think for me it's a great metaphor for interdisciplinary work. Because if we really want to address this question, we need to work together because none will have of us will have the complete knowledge but all together working together we can get there and i want to finish just drawing your attention to the fact that in 10 days exactly on 27th of march there will be the international day of multilingualism uh, which commemorates the date engraved on Rosetta Stone and in fact the Polish Embassy is organizing an event with the uh, Ilona Regulski who is the curator of the Egyptian uh, of the Egyptian collection British Museum uh, so responsible for Rosetta Stone and an expert in multilingualism in the ancient world she will be zooming in from Cairo so you see zoom might some make some things possible so uh, you can simply look on Facebook or website International Day of Multilingualism but the easiest thing is simply uh, to follow me on Twitter I will be definitely tweeting all the links uh, for the events and now I would be delighted to answer any questions preguntas en portugués también y hasta más fácil en español Thank you Thomas um, for that very interesting uh, talk, which covered an awful lot of ground. Zooming um, in from Cairo, so you see Zoom might some might some things possible. So uh, you can simply look on Facebook or website International Day of Multilingualism. But the easiest thing is oh, Thomas, if you can switch off all browsers, close any browser you might have open. We're getting an echo again. And uh, now, okay, I'm one moment. Ah, uh, okay. To so answer any questions? Ah, there we go. I think we've got it now. Ah, that was it. Okay. Oh, I wish I could have done. But you, you could hear me. It was not that I was just speaking in, into silence. No, no, we could hear you fine. Okay, um, fantastic. So that's wonderful. Thank you very much uh, for that stimulating talk. And um, please, anyone who hasn't already asked a question, feel free to, to uh, ask your question in the chat. Um, we have one question in at the moment. But if I can be selfish and take the floor initially, I'm going to actually just, uh, as often happens, start the questions with your, in relation to topics you covered on the last slide about uh, interdisciplinary work, Thomas. I wonder if you might just say a few words about perhaps why there isn't, in your opinion at least, more interdisciplinary work uh, in, in, in terms of these various um, subfields that you've mentioned in relation to biological approaches, cognitive approaches, emotional approaches, etc. Um, do you think that it's because researchers, to use a term that's uh, quite prevalent at the moment, are self-isolating uh, in their own discipline? Or do you think it's that they just don't have opportunities to engage with experts outside their immediate field? Uh, 
uh, I think personally, so thank you very much for the question. I mean, I like always to say that, you know, interdisciplinarity is a little bit like altruism. It's much more often professed than practiced. Mm -hmm. And uh, the usual explanation is, oh, yeah, because people are so kind of narrow minded and so on. To be honest, I don't think that's the main reason. I think the main reason is because we still have the kind of the old divides in academia between departments, between uh, you know, research councils, even within journals, and so on and so on. So in fact, there are enormous burdens. I mean, everybody loves to hear about interdisciplinarity, but if you try to do it, it's very, very difficult. It will come first, you know, do you apply for a grant to whom? For it will be too humanistic for one or too much neuroscience for the other and so on. I had this problem very, very often where basically A say it was to B and B said it was to A. And also there are no jobs at universities. I mean, you work only in one department. I mean, how many people? I mean, I was sometimes kind of between medicine and psychology. It was not easy. I think we would need to have university positions, grants and journals that would only say this is only if you have at least two or maybe three different disciplines. Okay, very interesting. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll read out the question that I have at the moment. Um, this one comes from uh, Olga Ivanova. Thanks a lot, Thomas. How can we methodologically discriminate between where sociolinguistic and where biological bias is in understanding language impairment in dementias? Well, I, I think the first thing is, I mean, in medicine itself, we always speak about biopsychosocial model. So the idea is the, uh, the idea is basically that, uh, you know, you cannot do justice. I mean, definitely to dementia patients if you focus only on one of those three areas. So of course you have to pay attention to biology because that will decide probably the prognosis or maybe the treatment and so on and so on. But it will not determine everything. You also have to know the patient's own history and so on. And then of course the social support. So I think there is no alternative to combining those three things. I would say looking at one without looking at the other two is always incomplete. Now, how we can, so to say, communicate better, I found it very interesting kind of reading books about sociolinguistics, for instance, that a lot of things are, let's say, you know, what in sociolinguistics is called panel study, we would call longitudinal study, what is probably called, you know, again, we have this kind of real time, uh, apparent time, we would call it slightly different, what you call age gradient, we would probably uh, say that would be kind of aging effect, by the way, triangulation, we would call probably converging evidence. So in many cases, this is really like two languages which occasionally map into each other quite well. Occasionally, like real languages, maybe a term is kind of going over one or two. But I mean, it's great fun to do that. I don't know why, why you know, we don't do it more. Excellent. And um, do you think that, um, if you'd like, uh, uh, fostering a greater awareness of those um, conceptual similarities which are labeled differently would would go some way to foster that kind of uh, interdisciplinary work if we could get away get, get over just the labeling and realize that the concepts are in some ways quite similar do you think that would be a step in the right direction absolutely well i i think firstly by by you know getting clear how we refer to things, we would probably also discover what are the genuine differences, and then they might also be relevant. But as I say, I think without looking at the language first, we'll not even get to this stage. So I would say for me, the first stage would be to kind of look, how do we use the terms? Then what is the kind of which association? Things have ideological associations. I mean, not only in sociolinguistics, also in medicine and and you know neuroscience and so on and so on. So I think it's a for me it's a kind of gradual thing. We start with the language and the terms, but then I presume we'll also discover differences in way of thinking. But as I say, that would be something which will be clearer once we once we uh, get the languages sorted. Okay, we have a couple of questions coming in. Um, now we have a question from Mona. Do you think this increased use of 
L1 in aging and dementia also extends to an original dialect if they have acquired another dialect within their language later in life? Uh, that's a very interesting question. I think I can imagine, I mean, the, the question must be coming from Norway uh, by judging uh, by dialects, but uh, I don't know about any work on that. That would be a very, very interesting thing to look at. I think I'm not, I am not really, I'm not really aware. I can tell you one story, by the way, which dialect, which I was told again after a talk by a woman from Switzerland. Now, if you know Switzerland, Switzerland is kind of, you have very much diglossia, which people speaking high German, Hochdeutsch, in the official, uh, so to say, formal settings. And then you have the uh, Swiss German, in this case it was Zurich, so uh, Zurich German, in normal, so to say, conversation. And the mother of this person was in a nursing home where she was really not feeling very happy. And she was only speaking Hochdeutsch. So people were even thinking whether it's a kind of some rare case that, you know, she lost her dialect and only can speak. So, you know, you can think, by the way, there are also biological cases where this happened, described in Friulia uh, by the group of, of Fabio Fabro. But what happened is, once she was transferred to another nursing home where she liked being, suddenly she started speaking Zurich Deutsch again. So basically, so for her, speaking uh, Hochdeutsch, High German, was a way of distancing yourself emotionally from the place with which you didn't have anything to do. And in a way, I think that's a nice example because I can tell you immediately one example which is very much emotional and social, and one example which is, bio which is biological from, from Italy, from Fabio Fabro. So both things can uh, can play a role here. Excellent. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, that, that last uh, example sort of speaks to... Um, Another subdiscipline, social psychology of language, and work done there on attitudes towards um, language varieties, etc. But maybe we can come back to that. We have a few more questions coming in. Um, good afternoon. This one comes from Eureka. Um, good afternoon. How do cognitive effects differ between bilingual and multilingual individuals, if at all? How do what effect? So at the um, how, how do cognitive effects differ yes, 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 yes. between uh, bilingual and multilingual individuals? Uh, well, there is quite a lot of conflicting evidence. So some studies, uh, and in fact, I was involved in studies with conflicting evidence. So some studies suggest that basically the big difference between one and two. Some studies suggest that there is still an improvement between two and three. There's even one study which found difference between two and three, but not one and two. Uh, I would say so far that probably the most likely explanation is that this is not a linear curve. So the biggest difference is one to two, then you have smaller two to three, three to four, and so on, and then probably around five or so it can start plateauing. I mean, that would be my, my working hypothesis at the moment. Okay. Um, now, that was really, now we have a question from Suzanne. Great talk. Many thanks. Do you know about studies of how code switching is affected by aphasia? Code switching in aphasia, a good question. I mean, I have to say in the time I was doing aphasiology, code switching was not in. And now that code switching is in, I'm doing mainly uh, multilingualism and dementia more than aphasia. So I have to say I'm not... Uh, I, I can't really think immediately. I can think of some people who uh, who might be working. Uh, maybe I don't know whether uh, whether Jorge Valdez is uh, listening to that, for instance, from Florida. So I could think I could think of some people who might be able to answer this much better than me. Okay. Um... Are there any other questions? Please do um, drop them into the chat. Um, Thomas, I'll just take it, the opportunity maybe to ask another question, uh, if you don't mind. Um, it, this was, is something that wasn't really covered in your talk, but it talks, it, it speaks to the similarities between the trajectories of fields. You and I have had conversations about, or we have discovered through our conversation, similarities between um, rehabilitation strategies with this phase, phasics and um, language teaching methods over the years. Is, is there anything you might want to say about that? How, how the trajectory of fields often look entirely different, but when you look closely, there's actually quite a bit of similarity. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating question. It goes back basically to the 19th century. 
So the first, the first approaches at aphasia treatment were very much, so to say, which nowadays would call didactic school, because I mean there were no previous examples how you should teach an adult a language that they kind of lost. I mean, it was kind of you know doing it like children didn't really appear uh, appear logical. So the first kind of 19th century aphasia work was very much was very much about the uh, about the you know teaching the language. And in fact, there's interesting. I mean, one of the books on language teaching also uh, is building on associationism, which was developed in aphasia. So I think this this was kind of quite close. I don't think it has been terribly close, so to say, for the last decades. However, both aphasia treatment and the uh, and uh, language teaching are, of course, subject to the same developments, so to say, in the field. So, for instance, yesterday night I was listening, probably like you as well, to Rod Ellis speaking about different uh, ways of, of uh, second language acquisition kind of theorizing and the social turn which came maybe in kind of you know, about 20 years ago of course it didn't came only there so I was mentioning here as well social turn came also in aphasia treatment much more tendency to group treatment and of course the social term I mean social cognition became a big topic and so on so I think that uh, as in 19th century there were some really direct connections where as as far as I know but as I say I would be, you know, I would be glad to hear uh, something to the contrary, but my feeling is that it's more that both fields are influenced by the same general intellectual uh, developments. Okay. Thank you. Um, great, some more questions coming in. This one comes from uh, Minia in Galicia. Can you tell us anything about how the linguistic changes these patients experience correlate to the evolution of their other cognitive abilities? Ah, well, I mean, that depends, of course, completely which time of aphasia it is. So, uh, I mean, let's say they, you know, ideally, or let's say many linguists moving into our physiology wish aphasia to be a pure language disorder without any adulteration of other problems. But that is, of course, rarely the case. I mean, if it's stroke, then if it's a more anterior stroke, then there will be also motor problems, dysarthria, and so on and so on. If it's more posterior, there will be perceptual problems, and the same in and the same in um, progressive aphasias in neurodegenerative aphasias. So for instance, there, there has been quite a lot of work on perceptual deficits in, uh, in um, uh, semantic dementia. And also, I mean, on the other hand, you can have also, uh, you know, uh, other deficits in kind of, uh, or kind of motor connected with more anterior forms. So there is a whole group of aphasias which basically combine movement disorders with aphasia. So one of the fields I was working on, I didn't mention it today, but it's still a topic of, of great interest for me, is aphasia associated with motor neuron disease. So you have patients who have basically a more or less selective degeneration of the motor parts of the nervous system, but that includes also the kind of motor aspects of cognition that includes, let's say, processing of verbs, but also abstract processing of actions. So from this point of view, I would say it really it would need to be answered very, very specifically for specific types of aphasia. But they are, in many cases, they are connections. So again, I think this kind of 70s idea of the, you know, of the autonomy of language is not something that you find really, uh, you know, working with patients so much. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, this question comes from Babel Babies. Uh, thanks, Thomas. I'm wondering if singing songs in a patient's attrited L1 could be helpful. Any studies look at singing and dementia and multilingual? Uh, well, a lot of studies. So some of the observation, some of the oldest observation of aphasia, going back to 17th century. For instance, Dolin from uh, from Sweden observed that people might be able to sing or to recite rhythmically. So to say, for instance, hymns. So very often there were religious texts, 
although they were not able to produce any propositional speech. So this is something which has been recognized relatively early, and in fact one of the most successful treatments of aphasia, uh, melodic intonation therapy, is which practically, let's say, ideas of teaching people, so to say, to sing or to use these melodic things have been there even in 19th, early 20th century, but then uh, late 60s, 70s, it was practically put together into systematic, well evidence tested treatment. And yes, it is very, very helpful. They are two, in terms of brain anatomy, there are two things to, so to say, to uh, look at. One is left versus right hemisphere. So you have left hemispheric stroke, then this kind of musical rhythmic things could be more related to the right hemisphere. The other is, so to say, cortical versus basal ganglia. So again, subcortical structures might still have, so to say, this rhythmic uh, function. So yes, absolutely, as I say, it's, it, and it is used in, in aphasia treatment. Great. Um, we still have time if anyone wants to ask another question. Um, I know Thomas really enjoys this portion of, of his presentations. Um, Thomas, I, maybe I'll just invite you is there, to, to say anything else that you might like to include that you didn't in your, in your talk. Uh, I know you were at one stage shortening your presentation. So is there anything you'd like to, to uh, include now that we have a few minutes? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a um, good, good question. Uh, I mean, there was one example, for instance, I mean, you know, coming to the kind of the question of variation, it was one example I took out, and I think it would be maybe nice, nice to give. And that is about a patient with herpes simplex encephalitis, uh, which I've seen in Cambridge. This is a disease, it was a viral disease that tends to like particularly middle temporal lobes. So there was memory problems, but there was also, there were also problems with semantics. And I was told this patient cannot really, you know, uh, has no clue about, for instance, animals. Animals are extremely popular as, as testing material because uh, you can really order them, you know, you have, uh, you can order them in different semantic categories by continent, by, uh, you know, their, uh, you know, uh, birds versus, versus uh, mammals and so on. And then I asked him, for instance, about the lion and then, and I said, okay, so what, what do you think a lion eats? And then he said, well, probably grass. So I said, okay, wonderful. So here I have a wonderful example. This guy has no clue that lion is in fact a carnivore and so on. And then in the same conversation, a little bit later, I asked him, you know, that, you know, what do animals eat? You know, some eat grass and others eat other animals. What would be a typical animal that eat other animals? Because probably the term carnivore would be, would be difficult then. And he said, well, a lion, of course. So that means depending on which way you were getting into this knowledge, he had or he didn't have it. And that was a moment where I think it kind of it started becoming clearer to me that, as I say, it's not just that you have, so to say, certain connections, certain knowledge that is being, being uh, knocked out, that this is very much something which is, which, so to say, depends on uh, depends on the way. So for instance, in this case, it is easier probably to move from carnivore to lion than it is from lion to the way what, what uh, lion eats. Okay, very interesting. We have another question that's just come in uh, from Nayara. We'd like to know, could you tell us about cognitive approaches in phraseology? If you have anything to say about that, Thomas. Cognitive approaches in aphasiology. Physiology. Um, hmm. Studies of, of, of choice of words or phrasing of, of arguments and that sort of thing. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to understand the question because, of course, I mean, they are very, I mean, most of the approaches to aphasia are in some way cognitive. So, I mean, it depends a little bit how you how you perceive the term cognitive. So one is, so one question starts with the question to what extent do you perceive language as part of cognition? And, uh, and uh, to what extent, I mean, so I would say almost all approaches to aphasia, to aphasia treatment, 
have some kind of cognitive theory behind it, but this cognitive theory will be different. So, so I'm I'm not not I say I'm not quite understanding how I could uh, how I could narrow it down to something which would be uh, which would be answerable. Maybe the question answer. Maybe you've answered the question, and if you haven't, we'd be more than happy to take a revised question. Um, Okay, another question coming in from Susan. Have there, been, have there been any studies looking at how reading fiction in different languages using imagination, empathy, cognition, identity, culture, etc., might support the delay of dementia? Well, the reading fiction is something which became more popular over the last, I would say, maybe just years. So it's relatively recent. Uh, there are studies suggesting that people sort of say, you know, uh, that reading is a, uh, you know, has a positive uh, effect. I'm not aware of looking specifically at reading, so to say, in different languages. Now, the problem that we have here, and I think that's a problem, so I'm glad about, very, thank you very much for the question, because the question allows me to highlight a big methodological problem with kind of correlation studies. And that is that unless you do it as a kind of intervention, you could say, so for instance, one of the classical things is people who are more active in their middle age usually develop dementia later. But here we come to this reverse causality, which I mentioned. That's why it's so difficult to address. So is it that they are active and therefore they become less demented? Or is it that certain passivity might be one of the preceding features of dementia? We know now that some type of dementia, for instance, can, not only dementia, also Parkinson's disease and so on, can be preceded years I mean, long, long years by very, very subtle changes, for instance, apathy, loss of drive, loss of interest, and so on. There's also increasing interest in apathy. So in this case, we come in the situation uh, that if you just look, for instance, how much were you reading and so on, I would be very surprised if you wouldn't find a correlation. But the point is, is it a causal one? And then we come with the question of intervention study. It would be quite difficult to say, you know, you are in the group, you have to read, you know, one novel a week, and you are in a group, you have to read, you know, one novel a month, and you are not allowed to read any novel. Uh, that might not be easy to implement. So I think there the, the is, so to say, this methodological conundrum of, of reverse causality in studying uh, such things. Okay, thank you. Um... There's no other questions in at the moment. Feel free. Um, I know, Thomas, you're happy to co to communicate yeah. with people via Twitter, via email, etc. Yeah. I presume because I, yeah. details were on your first slide, but in case you'd like to give them again. Yes. Yeah. So I, I think maybe I will I will give the the last slide. So let's look at one moment. I have to. Okay, so that, that was my last slide. So here, so here are the details. And also, I mean, obviously the slides will be, by the way, also here you see the, the links to the, uh, to the questionnaires. And, and uh, here are, here is the Twitter and the International Day of Motivators. Okay. So I think that brings us to the end of our discussion. Um, if you'd like to bring yourself back on camera, Thomas. Yes. Um, you can so stop I sharing can. if you'd like to make any closing remark. Um, no, so one moment. Uh, you're back now, we can I see stop. you. Yes, you can see me, okay. Uh, no, uh, thank you very much once again. As I say, I've, I'm really, really happy about the, the Abralin series. Uh, as I, you, you notice, I had you know, references to a lot of other Abralin talks. I think they are a fantastic way of, yeah, not only creating really a library of very different approaches uh, in linguistics, but also creating really kind of the sense of a global community. So I would be very happy. I already contacted some people after speaking with them, and I would be very happy if 
for anybody to contact me. Okay. Well, thank you again, Thomas, uh, on behalf of uh, Aberlin. Um, and to, I'd like to thank all of you who tuned in for this talk and for those of you who asked questions. Um, as I mentioned, Thomas has already indicated that he'd be happy to continue conversations uh, electronically um, if necessary. So we'll end it there. Thank you very much, Thomas. I suppose since it's St. Patrick's Day, I'll have to thank you in Irish. Muito um, obrigado for the business and um, we'll have a good night. <laughs>